Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today. My name is Stacey Matrazo. Um, I'm the program manager for the Florida Wildflower Foundation. And I will be talking to you today about some of the incredible edible native plants found in our landscapes. Um, just a little, well, if I can get this to work, here we go. Um, just a little housekeeping before we get started. Everyone is muted with your cameras off. Um, we are recording the webinar and we will make it available on our website and our YouTube channel um, within the next 24 hours. You can use the Q&A feature to submit questions at any point during the presentation. Um, I will answer as many as I can at the end, uh, time permitting, but if your question is not answered, please feel free to email it to us at info at flawildflowers.org and we will uh, get back to you. In case you're not familiar with us, um, we are the Florida Wildflower Foundation and our mission is to protect, connect and expand native wildflower habitat through our education, research and planting and conservation programs. We do this primarily uh, through funds raised from the sale and renewal of the state wildflower license plate. You saw our old plate there. We've now uh, for about almost two years now have uh, this wonderful new design. Old or new, your plate still contributes um, to us and allows us to um, do the programs that we do. These funds along with donations, uh, memberships and other um, other grants allow us to provide um, funding for native plant demonstration gardens and school gardens throughout the state, um, conduct research on a number of topics relevant to both the commercial and residential interests, and produce a ton of really helpful handouts and brochures on selecting, growing, and maintaining plants in your landscape. We'd like to encourage those of you who find our programs valuable to consider becoming a member and making a donation or purchasing the plate. All of those uh, ways help us continue to grow and provide the information that we do. So um, before we get started, I just wanna go over a few ground rules for foraging. Now this typically apply to um, foraging out in the wild, but they also apply to your landscape. First and foremost, make sure you know what uh, the plant is before you eat it. Always do your research, be certain what it is, ask an expert if you're not sure. Remember, all plants are edible once and you don't want to um, find out the hard way that the plant was um, toxic or poisonous. Another consideration to um, you know, know what you're gonna eat, but make sure that you introduce new plants in moderation to make sure that there aren't any side effects for your, for your personal conditions. Um, and just like many vegetables, you wanna harvest plants when they're young because a lot of plants as they get older, uh, they get tougher or less tasty. So um, most of the stuff I'm gonna be talking about today when I mention harvesting the leaves or the green, using them as a green, um, I'm talking about those young plants that are nice and tender. Secondly, uh, make sure you know the area from which you are harvesting, as well as how it's managed. Um, you want to make sure you're not taking plants that have been treated with pesticides or contaminated by chemical runoff. Now, again, in your yard, this is a lot easier to control. Um, but if you're out in the wilderness, you want to make sure you know what's happened to that plant before you eat it. And finally, in your landscape or in the wild, be considerate of the other um, people who will wanna enjoy these plants, as well as the wildlife that rely on the plants you're harvesting. Um, make sure that you have expressed permission of the landowner if you're, if you're you know, harvesting off of your own or um, somewhere else besides your own landscape. Um, and no, the side of the road is not really <laughs> what we're talking about here. Um, of course, that also subjects you to a lot of other contaminants and things, so, and it's dangerous. Um, don't harvest an endangered plant. Don't take the last plant's flower or fruit, because again, that's food for wildlife. Um, and you don't want to eliminate the possibility of other people being able to see and enjoy the plants too. And finally, um, just to be clear, any references I make to uh, medicinal properties are purely anecdotal or based on historical or cultural information. They are not meant to diagnose, treat, or cure any disease. So 
please, if you have a medical condition, make sure you see your doctor um, before trying a natural remedy. So with that said, let's get started. Um, I divided this talk into uh, two sections. The first um, is the common landscape plants. These are plants that you can purchase at your native plant nursery. They are plants that are commonly used in native plant landscaping, easy to find, um, generally available, and, and easy to grow as well. If you're in central or north Florida, meadow garlic is a great plant to consider. Um, we are, I'm in central Florida and I'm about at the bottom of its range. Um, it doesn't really like south Florida climate and conditions too much. Um, but again, north and central Florida, this is a great plant. Um, any plant that looks like a garlic and smells like a garlic is a garlic and you can eat it. Same with onion, they're, they're um, very similar plants in the same family. Um, this one grows or blooms in late winter through spring, and uh, it attracts a lot of pollinators, mostly moths. Um, it's got a very small white flower, so it likes to, um, a lot of white flowers are attractive to moths in particular, um, and this is no exception. You can use this plant in its entirety, the same way you would use any other um, garlic or onion plant. So uh, you can use the bulb just like you would a store-bought onion. You can eat it raw if you're inclined to eat raw onions. Um, pickle it, saute it, whatever you would do with a normal onion, uh, you can do the same. The greens you can use just like you would chives. Um, chop them up, eat them raw. Um, they're great pickled. The, the bulb is actually good pickled too. And the flowers are edible as well. You can also transplant the bulbs or the bulblets that uh, you can that are formed on the flower and grow more plants from that. Medicinally, garlic is one of those wonder plants. Um, it's high in vitamins and minerals. It also has a lot of different um, properties associated with it. So you know you can go to your health food store and buy garlic um, pills. Um, but why take the pill when you can have this herb uh, growing in your own garden? Uh, beauty berry is, a, is another great one. Well, they're all great, and I'll say that a lot. These are all great plants for your landscape. They all have a really good uh, value to wildlife in addition to being um, good for us. Um, beauty berry grows throughout the state, so anywhere in Florida you can have this plant. Um, it's in the mint family, but it doesn't have that telltale minty smell that a lot of our mint, plant, mint family plants do. Um, for wildlife, it's great for providing um, food cover. The flowers are really tiny, but they do attract butterflies. Um, and it can bloom um, generally spring through summer, but can bloom year round as well. Um, for us, the fruit is the edible part. Uh, you can make a really nice jelly out of it. You can eat it right off the plant, but it doesn't have a great taste to it. It's kind of bland, um, a little pithy. The berries are very small and have this beautiful magenta color. Um, but they don't have a lot of juice to them, but you can make a jelly out of them that's quite tasty. Um, the, the leaves also have uh, an insect repellent aspect to them. So if you're hiking in the woods or um, in your landscape for that matter, and you have mosquitoes bothering you, you can just pluck a leaf off of your plant and rub it onto your skin and it will help keep insects at bay. Now, this is not a replacement for, um, you know, the, the stronger chemicals you can purchase in stores, um, but it's a nice natural way to help keep those mosquitoes away. Um, this is another central and north Florida plant. Um, again, doesn't do quite as well in southern Florida climes, but um, but here in Central and North Florida, this is an absolutely beautiful tree. Um, it puts out these, as you can see in the photo, these amazing pink blooms for about a month in the spring. Um, the tree is deciduous, so in the winter it loses all of its leaves, and right before it leaves out, it is just completely covered in, in pink blooms. It's quite stunning to see. It's in the Fabaceae or the legume or bean family, and so um, it does have edible pods, uh, bean pods. You can eat them, um, <coughs> excuse me, 
you can eat them raw. They do have a little bit of a bitter taste. They're kind of um, like a, uh, an unripe peanut, if you will, like a green peanut. So not particularly tasty, but you can um, fry them or saute them and they, they do have a nice flavor once they've been cooked. The flowers are also edible. Um, they are edible raw, again, not particularly tasty. Um, but they add a nice aesthetic if you want to freeze them in ice cubes and have like a nice little floating flower in your drink or cocktail. Um, or you can put them in a salad, again, just to make something um, a little bit attractive. And they're a good plant for um, attracting wildlife too, as I said, I'll go back here. Um, the flowers are really attractive to bees. And the plant is also a larval host for the um, alfin and io moth. And you will see it if you have these in your area, you will just see it completely covered in it. They love to devour the leaves. So as I said, that was a North and Central Florida plant. Cocoa plum is a Central and South Florida plant. We are here in Central Florida at about the Northern end of its reach. Um, this is another excellent plant for wildlife. Uh, it's a shrub or can be a, you know, a very small tree, but generally a shrub that you can prune to create a hedge or um, uh, a screen or use it as a specimen shrub, but it has really dense foliage. So it's great cover for um, wildlife. It has tiny flowers that attract mostly bees and it fruits and flowers year round. So it's a good one to have in your landscape if you have the right conditions because it provides resources all year long. The fruits you see here, I've got a red one and, or excuse me, a blue one and a white one pictured. It also produces a red fruit. Um, they're all the same. It just varies uh, on the, the, the variety of the plant or the conditions in which it's grown. But all of those plants are, or excuse me, all of those fruits are edible. You can make um, a jam out of it or a jelly. You can eat them raw. Uh, you can can them or turn them into syrup. They do have a nice flavor raw as well. And they have a really oil rich seed that you can also eat um, or cook, eat raw or cook. St. John's mint um, does pretty well throughout the state. Um, this one is a wet loving species. So if you live along um, the edge of a pond or a creek or any wet environment, this is a really nice ground cover. It's very low growing. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, when you're collecting plants, you wanna make sure you know what's happening to them, especially with plants that are found in wetland areas. Um, wetlands are nature's kidneys. They absorb all the chemicals and pollutants and all the nasty stuff that ends up in our water. And so more important than any plant, you wanna make sure that you are harvesting this from an area that has not uh, been treated with anything because it will, um, they will hold on to this. They're harbingers of these pesticides and, and other um, chemicals. This is another member of the, edible, or excuse me, the mint family. Um, and when you crush it, it does have that nice telltale mint scent to it. It also produces a really nice minty tea. Um, so you can take the leaves and the stems and either dry them or use them um, fresh in warm or boiling water, let it steep, and it'll give you a nice minty tea. It's very mild, um, kind of more along the spearmint side of things, but um, it's, it's very nice. Um, and like with other mint family plants, um, it is a nice digestive aid too. So if your tummy's a little upset and you've got some St. John's mint outside in your backyard, just pull it, make a little tea, and it does help calm the stomach. Pigeon plum is, uh, again, another South Florida plant, Central and South Florida. It does pretty well on the coast of Central Florida, but it is primarily um, thrives in South Florida. This one blooms in spring and summer, but it might bloom year round depending on the conditions. And it does have a nice creamy uh, white or greenish white flower to it. It fruits in fall and winter. So it's providing those uh, resources for wildlife uh, you know, into the winter months, which is nice to have in your landscape as well. For us, um, the fruit is the edible part. It can be tart and it can be astringent. So it's not particularly good if you eat it raw, but it's great made into a jelly. Um, you can also dehydrate it. 
and then rehydrate it if you're using it for cooking. And that kind of helps um, kind of lessen the astringency just a little bit. Firebush is one that is commonly used in landscapes. We see that a lot um, here in Central Florida and South Florida too. Um, it does do well in landscapes in, in North Florida. So it's pretty good for um, around the state. It's in the coffee family and it has berries very similar to our native coffee plant, if you're familiar with that. Although they turn a nice dark um, purple when they're ripe. And I think I have a picture on the next slide, but. For wildlife, it is excellent for attracting hummingbirds and butterflies, especially long winged butterflies like you see here in the photo. Um, it has dense foliage, so it's a nice plant to have in your landscape to provide that cover for wildlife. And those berries are um, eaten by birds and other small mammals. And us too. Um, they have a nice flavor to them, although they vary, vary, um, they vary a lot <laughs> in taste. So some of them can be very sweet. Others can have a drying, astringent effect. Um, there aren't any cautions with this plant. However, I've had uh, personal experience with people who have done edible hikes with who have felt kind of a, a dry discomfort in the back of their throat when they've eaten it. So I would say um, to try this one, make sure you go very slowly and make sure it's not gonna um, you know, make you feel uncomfortable. If you get a really good one, it's quite tasty. They are, they are juicy and sweet uh, when they are perfectly ripe. And as you see in the picture, they start off this kind of green, they turn red, but when they get that nice black purple color, that's when they're ripe, when they're plump and you can kind of feel how juicy they are when you touch them, that's when you want to eat them. It goes pretty quickly. Um, if you're keeping an eye on them, they will dry up pretty soon after they ripen. And you can see in the photo some of the um, kind of raisiny looking ones too. You don't want to eat them when they get to that um, point. Medicinally, uh, if you make an extract out of the leaves, it is known to have uh, analgesic and anti-inflammatory properties as well. Um, this is probably one of my favorites just because it's, um, it's just a really cool plant all around for not only for us, but for wildlife. It can flower and fruit simultaneously, and it tends to um, have a long bloom and fruit period. Um, this is Yalpin holly, if I didn't mention it. Um, it's great uh, as a specimen plant or um, in mass in your landscape as a buffer or screen. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's really great for, again, wildlife. Uh, dense foliage provides cover. Fruits are eaten by birds mainly, and then those small white flowers I mentioned are um, attractive to bees and other pollinators. For us, uh, the best part about it is the tea you can make out of it. Um, the tea can be made from either fresh leaves and stems or dried or roasted leaves and stems. Um, this is the only plant native to North America that contains caffeine. So even though we have a native coffee plant, it is not the same coffee that you get from the stores. There's no caffeine in it, but this holly, this one holly species is the only one that has caffeine. Um, it's caffeine is comparable to coffee or green tea, but it has, the way it's absorbed in the body, um, it just has a lot more mild effects. So even when you drink it, um, if you drink you know, a couple cups of it, you don't get that kind of heart pumping eh, that you do with coffee. Um, it's really nice. There, um, it's a company in New Smyrna called Yalpin Brothers, which makes this tea. They they har wild harvest Yalpin leaves and they sell it commercially. Um, and you can purchase it in a lot of markets around the state and on their website as well, yalpinbrothers.com. Um, but it, if you're familiar with um, what's happening with our citrus industry, it's declining. And so there are a lot of people looking for other commercial products to kind of become Florida's next best agricultural product. And Yelp and Holly is well on its way, um, especially now that we have uh, this company in New Smyrna that is uh, creating these products. They have different flavors. Um, anyway, it's, it's really a good tea if you wanna buy it, but if you have it in your landscape, you can just harvest right out of the tree and make a, a nice, um, nice tea out of it. Its name is a little misleading, um, Ilex vomitoria. There's a lot of different stories behind why it has that name, but don't be turned off by that. Um, it, it has a reputation of 
causing or having emetic properties, but it's a myth. It's not true. Um, like I said, it's just a mild caffeination. So it's, it's just really an all around wonderful plant to have. Uh, this is dotted horseman. This is a great one for attracting pollinators to your landscape. Um, it attracts such a diverse variety of, of wasps and bees and other insects. Um, it's another one that's in the mint family, and it has more of an oregano or a thyme-like scent to it. And that's because it is high in thymol, which is a chemical that has um, antiseptic properties and antifungal properties. It also makes a really nice um, kind of relaxing tea. You can harvest the leaves and the flowers, dry them out and um, put them in, steep them in hot or boiling water. And it makes um, a little bit more of a savory tea than say the St. John's mint that I had showed you earlier. Um, but it still has a little minty notes to it, um, a little bit of a oregano or thyme flavor, but it has relaxation properties, kind of like chamomile tea. So. Um, very nice, again, to have in your landscape for wildlife and as a source of something fun to drink. Uh, Simpson Stopper is um, a shrub to a small shrub-like tree, generally um, a shrub that, again, is nice for a specimen plant or you can combine it with other plants to form a screen or a buffer in your landscape. It's another one with very dense foliage, so good for um, providing cover for wildlife. The fruits are eaten by birds and small mammals, um, and they're eaten by us. They have um, kind of an interesting flavor. If you're familiar with Suriname cherry, which is a highly invasive species, and I absolutely do not recommend using it, uh, but it was commonly used in landscapes, and so you do see it um, a lot around here in Florida. This is its cousin, Simpson Stopper. Um, so the fruit is very similar. If you've tasted a Suriname cherry, it has a kind of similar taste, kind of like a cross between a tomato and a cherry. So not particularly sweet, um, but a little juicy, uh, a little, it's nice and different. Um, when they get ripe, you see on the picture here, they turn nice bright orange red and that's when uh, you can eat them. The seeds are bitter, so um, I generally would spit them out if I'm eating the, the fruit. But historically, the plant was used to treat diarrhea, hence its common name, Simpson's stopper. Um, there are a few stoppers related to it and, that have the same properties, but this is the one that has the edible fruit. Wax myrtle, um, another great plant found throughout Florida. Again, dense foliage, so a great cover plant to have in your landscape. It has these tiny little wax covered seeds that are uh, very attractive to birds. And they are something that we can eat too. Um, so they, like I said, they're wax covered. So if you, if you wanna access the seed, you have to boil the wax off. So you collect all these tiny little seeds, put them in boiling water, and the wax will actually separate and rise to the top of the pot. You can collect the wax and make a candle out of it. If you're familiar with bayberry candle, which is a very common scented candle, this is bayberry. Wax myrtle is, um, is bayberry. So you can use the wax to make a candle, and then what's left, you can um, grind up the same way you would with uh, black peppercorn. Um, the leaves can also be used uh, similarly to like a bay leaf. You can kind of take them off and dry them and then put them in your stews or soups as a mild uh, seasoning, the same way you would do that with a bay leaf. Prickly pear is um, another plant that you can, well, you can eat just about the entire plant of, of this species. Um, it's in the cactus family. It is, again, not to be repetitive, a great plant for wildlife um, because it does provide food in the form of its fruits, but its flowers are also um, very attractive to bees, flies, beetles, um, and skipper butterflies as well. For us, you can make a whole meal out of this plant. The pads, which are those broad, um, you know, paddle-like structures, 
are edible. You have to be very careful when handling this plant. The entire thing is covered in spines. And you can see in the photo the, the big spines that are on the pads. So if you collect the pads, it's best to handle with gloves anyway. But you can take a potato peeler or a knife and kind of just cut those spines right off before you use it. But then you can cut this into chunks or even leave it whole and fry it. If you've been to a Mexican restaurant where they have nopales on the menu, that is cactus, prickly pear cactus. Um, it does have a little mucolous, mucolaginousness. <laughs> I always struggle with that word. Um, so it's mucousy. It has like, a, like an aloe plant would. Um, but cooking that will help uh, lessen that effect. So it's not slimy once you've cooked it. The seeds from the plant can be um, dried and roasted and ground into flour. Um, and of course, the fruit, prickly pear fruit, um, we can eat it, again, once you've removed its um, spines. So it doesn't have those big spines like the pad, pads do. Um, they're very tiny hair-like spines, but you can blanch it the same way you would um, if you've ever tried to take a, the skin off a tomato. So get your boiling water, put the prickly pear fruit in quickly or just for a, a minute or so, and the skin will come off. Again, I, I recommend using gloves because uh, those, you know, handling it, those hairs are tiny and they will get stuck in your skin and you will not be happy. Um, so you can eat it or you can juice it, turn it into um, a juice or a jelly, um, you know, any, anything that you've had prickly pear in before, you can pretty much do out of the fruit and it's, it's very tasty. It's high in vitamin C and minerals. And the fruit is known to also stabilize blood sugar levels. So it does have that property as well. And this is a plant that's suitable for use throughout the state of Florida. Um, another mint family plant that makes an excellent tea is wild pennyroyal. This is a, a pretty low growing shrub, small, um, small shrub that provides nectar uh, at a time of year when a lot of other plants aren't blooming. It flowers mostly in winter and uh, late winter and spring. So it's one of those early sources of food um, for butterflies and bees and other pollinators that are returning from um, other parts of the country. Um, for us, we can make a tea out of it. Again, it does have that same minty taste. Um, you can take the leaves and dry them or use them fresh. This one sometimes has almost a lemony mint scent or flavor to it. So it does depend on the conditions where it's growing, um, how that will vary, but it's very subtle, but it's still um, a nice mint flavor. This plant is nearly endemic to Florida. There's a very tiny population in Southern Georgia, but otherwise it's found nowhere else in the country except here. And it is um, a drought tolerant plant you find it a lot in scrub and scrubby habitats, but it does need water to get started. So um, just to clarify that. Um, I mentioned how a cactus, you could eat the whole plant. Pine is another one of those plants that you can eat pretty much the entire thing. Um, it's not easy to get to all the edible parts of the plant. So um, this is really famine food if you're in the wilderness. But if you are in the wilderness, keep this in mind because this is the plant that will sustain you. And our landscapes uh, is an excellent plant to have for wildlife because it provides so many resources. Um, you know, many, many species utilize pine trees for habitat, birds, small mammals, reptiles, amphibians, even the bark hosts uh, a, a ton of different microorganisms and insects. The seeds as well on the cones are eaten by a variety of wildlife too. So it's a really nice plant if you have the space for it in your landscape. Um, but again, for us, there's a lot of different parts of it that we can eat. The easy stuff to get to are the needles. Um, the green needles you can use the same way you would use rosemary, for example. Um, you can take those green needles and chop them up and put them in vegetables or anything else that you might roast with rosemary. And it'll work the same way or saute with it. Um, you can also make a, a really nice tea out of it. It has a lemony flavor to it. Um, it's kind of an acquired taste. If you eat the leaves fresh, uh, the green leaves fresh, like you can chew on them, 
they do kind of have a pine salt taste to them, but don't let that discourage you uh, because it, it, if you make a tea out of it, um, it doesn't kind of, it doesn't maintain that, that cleaning <laughs> fluid flavor. Um, it does have a lemony taste to it. You don't want to boil it though. If you boil the needles, it will release the terpenes, which are very bitter and uh, it will make your tea really uh, not taste good. So you can do like a sun tea with it, put a whole bunch of needles in a nice jar and set it outside in the sun for a day or two. And uh, it will just kind of emit that, that nice subtle lemony taste. Um, the roots of the tree are edible. Again, this is famine food. The bark is also edible. You can steep it in water and add sugar to it to make a really nice drink. Um, the cambium, the inner bark is also edible. If you boil it or fry it or roast it, you can also turn it into flour. Um, the pollen cones too, and those are easy to harvest, are really high in protein. So they don't have a lot of flavor, but you can add them to things like smoothies or other, uh, mix them into batters, for example, to add that protein um, without compromising the flavor. And even the resin, the sap of the tree um, is edible. You can chew it. Um, it was used historically to remove um, sugars from the teeth. So it was chewed after eating. And the plant itself is very high in vitamins and minerals too. Particularly the needles um, are incredibly high in vitamin C. They're four to five times higher per serving than citrus. Now, a serving of needles, I don't know exactly how many that is. I gather it's probably a lot, um, but it is a, a, a good source of vitamin C if you're using it um, in, in quantity. We have um, in Florida, a, a non-native porter weed that is often used in landscapes. Um, so um, this is a good one to have, but you wanna make sure that you're getting the native variety um, the non-native one is actually invasive, so you do need to be careful. Uh, make sure you know where you're purchasing these plants from if you are um, considering this one for your landscape. The native blue porter weed is low growing. It only gets you know, a little over a foot tall and it spreads out. It's much more of a um, kind of a high ground cover, whereas the non-native, the invasive species is more upright. And that's pretty easy to tell the difference if you see them together. So if you want to add this to your landscape, make sure you're getting the, the native um, species. This is um, a good source or good uh, tractor of butterflies. The flowers open in the morning. By the afternoon, they typically close up, but it does produce a lot of flowers. And so even though the flowers are short-lived, um, it, it is a nice prolific bloomer. Um, it's typically summer, but it can bloom in, in throughout the year, depending on uh, the climate and conditions. And it's also a larval host um, for the tropical buckeye, which is always nice to have larval hosts in your landscape. Um, the edible aspect of it, the, the flowers are really tasty. They're very tiny, so you don't get a lot of bang for your buck. Um, but it has kind of a, this is going to sound interesting or funny, but it tastes kind of like a vanilla mushroom. So it has a nice earthiness to it, but it also has a little hint of sweetness too. Um, so you can pluck these right off the plant or collect a few and add them to a salad for a nice, you know, edible flower um, adornment. The flower spikes, these long um, spikes you see sticking out of the plant can be used like you would use a bay leaf. So again, add it to your soups or stews to, um, to give it a little bit of a flavor. And the leaves themselves can be steeped into a tea. They're also traditionally and historically used in beer brewing. Um, the leaf adds a foamy quality to uh, the brew. And so we think that's why the name porterweed has been attached to it. Although I haven't found a conclusive source on that, um, but it's the only thing I've heard that makes any bit of sense. Um, for that name, Porter Weed. Spiderwort is another plant whose flowers open in the morning and close in the afternoon, but just like the Porter Weed, it is a prolific bloomer. It's usually got lots and lots of blooms just waiting to, to burst open. Um, it blooms or grows throughout the state. Well, it's typically central and North Florida, but it does pretty well in South Florida um, as well. It's great for attracting pollinators, especially bees. 
Bees don't see red, so they are more attracted to blue and white and yellow flowers. Um, and this one in particular, uh, it's just bees love it. For us, we can eat pretty much the whole plant. Um, the leaves and stems have a, a mucousy texture inside, like I mentioned with the cactus. Um, so if you want to eat, you can eat them raw, but it's better to saute them or cook them in some way to kind of get rid of some of that mucousiness. Um, but you can also use it the same way you would aloe on a skin condition. So if you have a little cut on your arm or a little insect bites you and you're working in your yard, you take one of those leaves and break it open, kind of squeeze it a little bit, that aloe-like juice will come out and you can use that on the abrasion to help lessen the, the sting or the, the discomfort. The flowers themselves are edible. Um, you can eat them raw, put them on a salad, again, to add a nice dash of color, or you can candy them. Um, you can take the, make a nice uh, sugar syrup, take the flour and dip it in and let that sugar syrup harden on it. And you have a really beautiful candy that you can use on you know, cakes or um, you know, just to add a little splash of native color to your uh, desserts. All of our blueberries are um, edible to us and they are all excellent plants to have in your landscape for wildlife. Um, they do produce berries that are eaten by birds and mammals. Um, the flowers, these lovely little urn-shaped flowers are, are very attractive to pollinators, especially bees. And of course for us, um, we love the fruit. They are high in antioxidants, high in vitamin C, uh, high in minerals as well. Um, this pictured here is shiny blueberry. We have several different varieties of, or species of blueberries that you can find at your native nursery. Um, when they get ripe, they turn a dark blue. I unfortunately have a hard time finding a photo of a nice ripe native blueberry. Um, but they do turn that same deep blue color that your commercial blueberries turn. So that's how you know they're ripe. They're typically smaller than a lot of the commercial blueberries. Um, but they are just as tasty, um, especially picked fresh on a warm summer's day. They just have uh, an, an awesome taste to them. Um, and they're really easy to grow in the landscape as well. And another easy one is common blue violet. All of our violets have uh, the same properties, edible properties. Um, this is just the one that's most commonly found. It has a nice blue flower. Um, again, the leaves and stems are edible. They have that kind of mucousy texture to them as well, not quite as, um, as much as the spiderwort or definitely not as much as the cactus, um, but there's a little bit of it. So if, you're, if it's easier or better to cook them than to eat them raw. But this texture actually adds a thickness to um, what you're cooking. So they're, they're a nice addition to soups or stews to help thicken them and add a little bit of green and a little bit of vitamins to um, whatever you're cooking. The flowers are edible raw and they are also another nice one to candy. Um, the same way that the spiderwort is um, good for that. They have these nice broad flowers. So when you put them in the sugar water, they kind of open up and they they harden really nicely and again, make a nice adornment to um, you know, whatever you want to add it to. So I mentioned I was dividing this into two sections. I have a few more plants I want to talk about that we, we typically call them weeds, but of course a weed is just a plant that we didn't put there. You know, it shows up on its own, shows up sometimes where we don't want it, but all plants have values and virtues, even if we don't recognize or appreciate them. And so these last few plants that I talk about are not plants that you're generally going to purchase from a native nursery. You're probably not going to seek them out to add them to your landscape, but they may end up there on their own because they are kind of these prolific species that we found, uh, we find in our landscapes. Um, and so I'm telling you this because I'm encouraging you that if they show up, keep them, give them space um, and, and let them provide the resources that they provide and provide some enjoyment for you too. I'm sure everyone is familiar with Spanish needles. Um, you can't live in Florida without encountering this plant. 
Um, if you have it in your landscape, yes, if you let it go, it will take over. Uh, but you can leave it, you can, you know, give it space, weed out a lot of its um, little sprouts that are coming up, but leave a couple of specimens because it's a very important nectar source for uh, bees and butterflies. It's our third most reliable nectar source um, in Florida of all of our plants. The first is citrus and our citrus industry is dying and it's not a native plant anyway. And so we can't rely on that too much longer. Um, but Spanish needles, we know this is everywhere. So um, I won't harp on that too much. But if you have it in your landscape, it also provides um, you know, some food for you. The flowers are edible. The leaves are edible um, raw, or you can saute them or cook them just like you would any other green. Um, this one in particular, you definitely want to harvest it when it's young because it does get tough and a little bitter as it gets older. So if you want to harvest the greens, um, definitely look for the seedlings that are coming up or those younger plants to um, harvest from. If you have a dry landscape and a sunny landscape, you've probably got pepper grass. Um, this is a pretty subtle plant. Uh, you know, when you have a few popping up, it's not that noticeable. But in mass, it does make a nice little display because it is such a unique looking plant. Um, it's a larval host, so great to have in your landscape. Um, it's tiny flowers do provide nectar for butterflies and small bees. Um, and it's a great plant for us because we can eat everything above the ground. Um, the leaves themselves, you can cook them or um, add them to a milder green. Uh, they have a little spicy taste to them. Um, and as you can see, they're in the uh, Brassicaceae family, which is mustard or cabbage. So it does have kind of that little bit of kick to it that a mustard plant would, um, but it's not too intense. But if you mix that with a milder green, it just adds kind of a nice flavor to that. The seeds are the best part of this though. And you can see them in that bottom picture with the flowers. They look kind of like, um, I'm gonna lose my words now. They look like crushed red pepper seeds. And that's exactly what you can use them to replace. If you dry them out, um, you can put them in your food the same way you would red pepper flakes. They have that nice little kick to it. Um, it used to be called, or maybe it is still called poor man's pepper. Um, for that reason. And you can also use them to flavor things like vinegars or, um, you know, other cooking liquids, oils as well, because it will impart that nice, subtle um, spiciness to whatever liquid you, um, you seep it in. Um, wood sorrel, we have a couple non-natives that are pretty common in the landscape. They have pink flowers. Our native one that you see here has a yellow flower. It's a little bit smaller than the non-native species, but all of them are edible. The roots have um, a nice sweetness to them. In other parts of the world, the, the oxalis uh, plant is actually a delicacy because of its root, um, but here, not so much, but it's edible and it has a nice taste to it. The leaves uh, and the flowers are also edible. You can make a tea out of them. This has a nice tangy lemon taste to it. It's very um, tart and pretty bold as well. And that's due to the oxalic acid content. And that's where it gets its name, oxalis, from that oxalic content. Now, if you have um, kidney stones or gout or other issues of that nature, you do want to be careful when consuming this. Um, oxalic acid is bad for those conditions. Um, it inhibits calcium absorption. But I also want to, on the other side of that, say that many of the plants that we eat also contain oxalic acid. Beans, spinach, chocolate, um, a lot of nuts and berries. You know, there are a lot of plants that include or that contain oxalic acid. So um, if you have this kind of condition, it's just something you need to be aware of. But otherwise, um, it's, a, it's a really fun plant. Um, when I used to teach summer camp, we had this in St. John's Mint and the kids always wanted to go see the candy and taste the candy. And I thought that they were referring to the mint because of course mint is candy. Um, but this is the plant that they all wanted because it almost has like a, if you eat Sour Patch Kids or Jolly Ranchers, it really has that nice zing to it that um, the kids love too, and I do too. 
But you can make a tea out of it, um, add some sugar to it, and you've got a nice Florida lemonade-like drink. And finally, um, I, I end with betony. This is a, another just all around wonderful plant um, that I think is underrated. It's another mint family plant, but it does not have that minty flavor or scent to it. Um, it was once considered endemic to Florida, but it has uh, eked its way outside of the state. But it has a lot of folklore behind it too. Um, people used to think that it was effective against sorcery and bad dreams, and so they would plant it around their houses or even in churchyards to ward off ghosts. Um, now it just kind of pops up like a weed. It has this delightful little pink flower um, that blooms. It can bloom year-round, um, but pretty much the entire plant is edible. You can cook the greens or dry them and make a tea out of it. Of course, the tea doesn't have a lot of flavor to it, but you can do that. Um, you can also cook the stems and flowers the same way you would cook greens. But the best part of this plant is its tuber or its root, which is very radish-like. Um, if you pull it out of the ground at the right time, it looks like a grub, like a little white grub. Um, it also kind of looks like a rattlesnake's rattle. It used to be called, or sometimes it's called rattlesnake weed for that reason. Um, you can eat this raw and it's just like a very mild radish. It's crisp, um, doesn't have a, a strong flavor, but it's nice. You can chop it up and put it in your salads, um, cook it or pickle it. You don't want to eat it there once it starts turning tan or soft because that's when it's going bad and it doesn't taste nearly as good. So it's best to take it, um, you know, harvest it before the summer heat really kicks in. Um, and that's when it's gonna have the best taste as well. So these are just a few of the many, many native plants that have edible, medicinal, uh, nutritional properties to them. There are a ton of resources out there to help you identify these plants um, and to identify their, their values and their virtues. Um, these are a few of my favorites. I definitely recommend starting with Peggy Lance's book, Florida's Edible Wild Plants. Um, this is the only book that is specific to Florida's native species, at least that I have found. Um, so you, you know everything in there is going to be a native plant and it also includes lots of really fun recipes so you, to tell you not only that it's edible but here's what you can do with it. Um, other books like the Peterson Guide and Wild Edibles are great for uh, identifying in the field but they are, um, they span the entire country so you're going to get a lot of plants that you probably won't find here. Um, and then Dean, Green Dean. <laughs> on Eat the Weeds is a great resource. Um, he has a website. You can look up just about any plant that is found in Florida, native or not, and find out what the deal is with it. He's also got uh, an entire set of DVDs if you wanna watch some episodes, and he does foraging um, trips throughout the state. So check out his website if this is something that you are interested in exploring. Um, that was a lot to cover, but uh, thanks for, for listening and I hope you learned something. I hope you uh, found some plants that you can appreciate in a different way. Um, for more information and resources, definitely check out our website. Uh, most of the species I mentioned today have um, a profile on our website so you can learn a little bit more about them. Um, I think we'll take some questions, but of course, if we don't get to them today, um, please email us and we will um, get to you as soon as we can. And also, just as an aside, if you're interested in applying for our Viva Florida Landscape Demonstration Garden Grant, which is open to botanical gardens, nature centers, and other public places um, to install a native plant garden, um, please check out our webinar on December 2nd, where um, we'll take you through the application process and then also answer any questions you might have about that. So with that, um, I will turn this over to Lisa and see if we have any questions. Okay, yes, we have quite a few. Um, first, let's go back to St. John's Mint. Uh, what light level does it need? And is it also known as Bacopa? Good question. Um, I will answer the second part first. It is not Bacopa, but it's often found growing in the same habitat and among Bacopa. It's also very similar looking. Um, they're both low growing. They both have a 
purplish bluish flower. Um, we have two kinds of bacopa. We have a lemon bacopa. If you crush that, it smells very lemony. We also have a, another bacopa monieri that does not have a smell to it. If you crush it and it smells like mint, it's probably St. John's mint. Um, that's the way to tell them apart because they all grow together and look very similar. Um, St. John's mint also has a square stem, which is common to uh, members of the mint family. So that's another way to tell the difference the bacopas have a rounder stem. Um, as far as light, um, this grows well in full sun to partial shade. It doesn't do well in like super deep shade, but it can tolerate a good amount of, of shade as well. Great, okay. Um, moving on to firebush, are the berries, uh, can they be used on the skin as an antifungal? The berries? I don't have any experience with that. Um, the leaves, if you make an extract from the leaves, I do know them to have an antifungal property that way, but I don't think, I've, I've not heard that the berries have mm -hmm. that. Okay, and Melanie wants to know, um, how do you make a leaf that extract? You kind of crush it up and put it in um, alcohol. So you'll have to soak in alcohol. Um, I'm not sure how long it, it's, if you're not working in a lab, it's really hard to tell because of course every leaf is going to vary, um, but you would leave it in there, I would say at least a week or two and just um, let the properties, you know, zoot out into the alcohol and then you can either um, strain it and use it or leave the um, leaves in it and until you stop using it, I suppose, but okay. yeah, just putting it in alcohol. All righty, um, Tanya wants to know if the dwarf Yopan Holly has the same properties as Yopan holly. Yes, it does. Okay. But as long as it's Ilex vomitoria, we do have different varieties of that, but um, it's, as long as it's a true Yopan, it has those same properties. And the other hollies, as an aside, we have three other hollies that you can make tea out of, um, but they don't have caffeine. I think I mentioned that. this is the only one with caffeine, but we do have other hollies that you can make um, a tea out of. Great. Athena asks if uh, Yopan holly stems are edible, could, could you use them as wood for grilling skewers? I don't see why not. Um, I just don't know if it would impart caffeine into your food. Um, and perhaps that's not an issue, but um, yeah, I would, I would think you could, you could do that for sure. There depends on, I would say maybe the branches because the stems are pretty thin when you get down to the stems where you're harvesting the leaves off them they are pretty thin so they may you may have trouble skewering anything with it um, but if you went for a larger branch I'm sure that would be fine okay um, can you use monarda as a cooking herb yes Yes, you can. Um, just thinking through what you can do with it. Um, yeah, it doesn't have the same reaction to heat that um, that pine does. So, it, you know, heating it isn't going to change its effect. So um, I don't, I've never done that. I don't know how strong of a flavor it's going to provide, but, um, you know, cooking it should be fine. Give it a try and let me know if it, if it gives your food an oregano-like flavor. Okay, and then um, a couple of uh, pine questions. How do you get the stuff from the cattens? And do you need to clean the plant before you eat it? Are all pines edible? All pines are edible. Um, do you need to clean it? I mean, yes. In, <laughs> so I forage in the wild. I don't clean things when I forage in the wild. Um, some people will tell you to do that simply because if you're, for, if you're taking anything out of nature, there's a good chance that there's bugs on it, whether you can see them or not. So if you're concerned about that, then certainly you would want to clean it. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I don't think there's any harm in it. Certainly, I don't when I'm in the wild. So um, what was the other part of the question? I forgot. Um, are all pines edible? Do you clean uh, pine before you eat it? And how do you get the stuff from the cattens? The catkins are, they're the, you just crumble them. So they're the cones that, 
that aren't the cones. I don't know how to explain that. Um, but they're, they're just the little, gosh, I don't know the right word. You just crumble it in your hand. So if you, if you take it um, and just rub it between your fingers, it will, the, the, the pollen will fall off. Um, it will just, you know, break apart in your fingers. It's very easy to, to get it off. Okay. Uh, Virginia asked, uh, you mentioned Biden's is the third best source of pollen and citrus is the first. So what is the second? Sao Palmetto, which is our native uh, Serenoa repens. That's our um, low growing palmetto. Um, yeah, that's our other, those are the top three. Okay. And then uh, Timothy wanted to know why is it not a good idea to eat dried uh, firebush berries? Uh, they just get really um, gross, to be perfectly frank. Um, I mentioned that some people have that reaction in the back of their throat. Um, the drier they get, the more likely that is to happen. In my personal experience, um, I can eat them without much of a reaction, but I have noticed that as they get older, it tends to just not feel pleasant. Um, it's not harmful, but they just, they're very drying and they don't have any flavor. It's really the juice that makes them tasty. And once they've dried, they have no juice in them. So they're just, it's just, you know, not, not tasty at all, but it won't harm you. Okay. Um... Lana has a good question. Um, she is from Texas and she said, do you know if any of these plants might be invasive to other parts of the United States outside Florida or would they be better than non-natives from other continents? Oh gosh, um, I really don't know. Oh gosh. I don't know if any of them are invasive in other parts of the country. I know some of them grow naturally in other parts of the country. Um, but as far as their, whether or not they are invasive, I, I don't know. Um, them being native, I would think, well, I don't wanna say that. I, I honestly, I don't know the answer to that. I think if it's native, you can find out if it's native to your area um, or find out if there are other species similar um, that are native to your area, like Monarda, is one that um, there are several species and they grow all over the country and they all have the same properties. Um, but I, I, would, I would just have to check with the local source to find out if it's invasive. Okay, um, a couple of blue porterweed questions. Uh, one is from Peter, does non-native blue porterweed have the same um, edibility as uh, the native? I believe so, but I have not, um, I haven't worked with that one. So I don't want to say that with certainty. Okay. And then uh, Glenda would like to know, um, is the loop for the weed an annual? Will it come back if it dies in the winter? It's a perennial. Um, so it it's, it's doesn't really lose its leaves, it hangs around. So even when it's not flowering, but like I said, it can flower year round, um, depending on the, the climate. And um, time for just a couple more, but what extract do you soak um, leaves in? Alcohol. Is it a, oh. what, kind, what type of alcohol? Oh, food grade alcohol. I mean, you can use vodka or, you know, Everclear, if you, if you keep that around, um, that's a really good one for, um, for making extracts with okay. high, and one, high potency. Okay. Sorry. Uh, one last one from Lois. She asked, could you name your top three pollen producers again, please? My top three pollen, are we talking about the nectar sources, the Biden's question? Um, and you named the top three, it was pollen producers, question mark, again. Okay, I'm not, I, I think we're talking about nectar sources with the Biden's, citrus, and saw palmetto. I didn't name a top, I don't have a top three pollen producer, um, but I mentioned the top three nectar, reliable nectar sources here in Florida as citrus, Spanish needles, and saw palmetto. I think that's what she's asking. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, one more question, and this is about Smilax. Do you know anything about its nutritional value? Um, not nutritional value per se. I know it's edible. Um, I know the berries are edible, but I have no experience with them. So I can't tell you anything about their flavor or what to do with them. Um, the, the young shoots are what I love the most because they taste like asparagus. Um, I, I don't know what their properties are in terms of whether or not they're high in vitamins or anything, but, um, you know, as the plant, the plant grows out of its tip and um, when it's nice and bright green and kind of soft and tender, you can break it off and eat it. And it's, it's quite good. Okay. And, and one last one, and, and this will be the last one. <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts on dollarweed is popping up everywhere in my garden? Uh, it's a great edible plant. Um, you can eat the whole thing. Um, it's, it's got some good, um, vitamin properties to it. Um, it's, it's nice because, well, again, when it's tender, when it gets older, it's tough and not very tasty, but you can saute it. Um, I like it if you, it's a, it's a wetland plant. So if you have it in your landscape and you aren't in a wet area, you're probably overwatering. I know that's an issue for people who have St. Augustine grass, they get dollar weed because they're watering, um, a lot. Um, but if you don't mind it, to me, it's, just go out and pick it and throw some in your salad or in your uh, stir fry tonight. All right. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, again, join us uh, in next month if you're interested in our grant program. And otherwise, check us out on our website and our social media to keep up with what we're doing. And thank you.